Mark chapter 9, verse 1, the Bible reads, And he said unto them, Verily I say unto you, that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death, till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now keep your finger here and go to Matthew chapter number 16, the very end of Matthew chapter 16, and we'll see the same statement from the book of Matthew in chapter 16, verse 28, where the Bible reads, Verily I say unto you, there be some standing here, this is Matthew 16, 28, which shall not taste of death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Now, what's interesting is that the way it's broken out in Matthew chapter 16, it's at the very end of a chapter. And when we look at it in Mark chapter 9, it's the first verse in the chapter when that exact same statement is made. But if you notice in Mark 9, 1, it starts with the word and. And he said unto them. Well, who are the them? So you have to get the context back in chapter 8. And if you look at verse 34 of chapter 8 in Mark, it says, And when he had called the people unto him with his disciples also, he said unto them, Whosoever will come after me, let him deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. And he's talking to the people at large, not just talking to the disciples, but he's talking to all the people. And he makes this statement that there be some of them that stand here which shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power. Now, if you were in that crowd of people that were standing there hearing that, the way you're probably going to interpret that is that the second coming of Christ is going to happen in our lifetime. Isn't that what you'd probably think? If you're standing there and Jesus says, some people that are standing here in this group will not taste death till they've seen the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. You would probably think that that were a reference to the fact that some people are older than others, and maybe the older people in the crowd, they're not going to see it in their lifetime. But you know, some of the people there, maybe some of the younger people, would see it in their lifetime. And also, in uh, Matthew 24, Mark 13, there's the statement about this generation shall not pass away till all these things be fulfilled. And some people will look at this scripture and look at that scripture and point this out as one of the greatest contradictions in the Bible. A lot of atheists will turn to this and say, hey, you know, Jesus promised that the second coming would happen in their lifetime and in their generation, and it just didn't happen. So there you go. It, it proves that it was false. But actually, that's not what this is saying at all. Because of the fact that, remember, when Jesus is talking to the big crowds, he never really tells them exactly what he means. He'll give them the parable of the sower, and they all walk away scratching their heads. Then he would take the disciples aside and explain to them what the parable of the sower meant. And you might look at that and say, why would Jesus do that? Why did Jesus not just clearly preach the word unto the crowds? But the disciples thought the same thing. And that's why the disciples even came to him and said, why speakest thou unto them in parables. Why do you tell us everything? Why do you explain everything unto us? But then unto the crowds of multitudes, you speak in parables. Why? And he said, unto you it is given to know the mysteries of the kingdom of God, but to them it is not given. That hearing they might hear and not understand. You know, Jesus knew that many of the people in these great multitudes and crowds were very insincere. They were not really uh, on board with the Lord Jesus. They did not really even believe in him. They are just there because people do things that are trendy. You know, when there's a big crowd of people going, a lot of people will just kind of jump on that bandwagon. It doesn't mean that in their heart they actually believed on the Lord Jesus Christ. Because some of the same people that are yelling, blessed is he that cometh in the name of the Lord on Palm Sunday, are going to be a few days later yelling, crucify him. Because that's how crowds and masses of people are. They're manipulated by other people. And so Jesus, for some reason, and we may not even fully understand why, but when Jesus is talking to the crowds, when he's talking to the multitudes, when he talks to unsaved people, he often would talk to them in a cryptic way, using parables and dark sayings that would cause them to not understand and to be misled. Just like the rich young ruler, he talks to the rich young ruler, and the rich young ruler goes away confused and doesn't understand it. And I think part of what that shows us is God is showing us that the word of God can only be understood by those who believe, by those who are saved. People that believe, people that are saved are going to be able to understand the Bible. An unsaved man, 
Think about it. Running to unsaved people out soul winning, and they're like, oh man, when I was in prison, you know, I read through the Bible cover to cover five times. But do you know for sure you're going to heaven? No. Nope. You know, and they don't understand it. They don't understand the gospel. Because if you're not saved, you could read the Bible over and over again. You're never going to understand it. Because the natural man receiveth not the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness unto him, neither can he know them because they are spiritually discerned. That's why we have to go out and preach the gospel to people and explain it to people and expound to them a clear presentation of the gospel. Because them just reading the Bible on their own, they're not going to get it. But Jesus, for some reason, when he was on this earth, whether we fully understand it or not, it's a fact that many of the things that he says in the gospels are cryptic, are parables, and do not give a clear statement to the people that are listening. But to his disciples, he would speak clearly and explain all things to them. Now, just to show you what's actually being said here, he makes this statement to the crowd. Hey, there be some standing here which will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Here, it's worded a little different. It says in verse 1 there at the end, till they've seen the kingdom of God coming with power. But remember, it's the same thing as when he said in Matthew, they'll see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom. Look at the next verse. And after six days, Jesus taketh with him Peter and James and John and leadeth them up into a high mountain apart by themselves. And his raiment became shining, exceeding white as snow, so as no fuller on earth can, can white them. And there appeared unto them Elias with Moses, and they were talking with Jesus. And Peter answered and said to Jesus, Master, it is good for us to be here. Let us make three tabernacles, one for thee, and one for Moses, and one for Elias. For he wist not what to say, for they were sore afraid. And there was a cloud that overshadowed them, and a voice came out of the cloud, saying, This is my beloved son, hear him. Now this event is known as the transfiguration, because in the other gospel where it shows it, it says he was transfigured before them, and his raiment became white and bright, and it was, it was such a, an amazing sight that Peter is scared and afraid and, and saying things that don't really make sense because he's just so terrified by what he sees. So when Jesus said, there be some standing here which shall not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom, this is what he's referring to. He's not saying, oh, those of you that are young enough will still be alive when it happens. What he's actually saying is that only some of them are going to see that sight. And the some that he was referring to are Peter, James, and John. Because, and it's like this in all the Gospels where he makes the statement, there be some of them standing here that will not taste death till they see the Son of Man coming in his kingdom or something similar. Always in the next breath, it's the transfiguration. Why? Because that's what he's talking about. He's saying that they're going to basically see Jesus Christ coming in his kingdom. So what they see is a foreshadowing or, or a, a sneak preview of Jesus Christ coming in his glorified state. Because when he's transfigured, they get to see what he's going to look like at the second coming. Because at the second coming, the Bible tells us that his face is going to be bright white like the sun and, and people are going to be terrified and so forth. And so they got to see that image of Jesus Christ coming in his kingdom. But can't you see how the multitude would have misunderstood that? And even today, atheists are misunderstanding it and saying, oh, there, there you go, that proves the Bible isn't true. But once you realize that and you read it, it's obvious that that's what he's actually referring to, that they're going to see the coming Christ, you know, glowing like the sun and, and so forth. Now, another thing that's interesting about this is that when he's coming, he has Moses and Elijah with him. And this is where the doctrine comes from that says that the two witnesses of Revelation are Moses and Elijah. And I personally believe that the two witnesses of Revelation are Moses and Elijah. They're not named as such in Revelation, but this is a pretty strong evidence right here that if they see Christ coming in his kingdom and who does he have with him, Moses and Elijah, it makes sense that Moses and Elijah would be the two witnesses of Revelation. Also, the two witnesses in Revelation 11 do a lot of the same miracles that Moses and Elijah did. They call down fire from heaven. They stop it from raining. They turn water into blood. It's, it's the same miracles that Moses and Elijah did in the Old Testament. So that's what this is actually referring to here. Now, while we're on the subject of Elijah, uh, they ask a question in verse 11. They asked him saying, and this is the disciples, why say the scribes that Elias must first come? 
So they see Elijah and Moses with Jesus, and that makes them think about the fact that before the day of the Lord comes, Elijah must first come. And so they say, why say the scribes that Elias must first come? And he answered and told them, Elias verily cometh first and restoreth all things. And how it is written of the Son of Man that he must suffer many things and be said it not. But I say unto you that Elias is indeed come, and they have done unto him whatsoever they listed as it is written of him. Now here it doesn't explain it, but in other places like in Matthew, it says that they then understood that he spake of John the Baptist. When he said that Elijah was already come, he was talking about John the Baptist. Now flip over to Malachi chapter 4, stay in Mark 9, but the last book of the Old Testament is Malachi, Malachi chapter 4. Because, of course, Jesus Christ said of John the Baptist, there hath not risen a greater than John the Baptist. And he said, and if you will receive it, this is Elias, which was for to come. Now, there's a place where it says that Jesus, or I'm sorry, that John the Baptist would come in the, in the spirit and power of Elijah. He would come in the spirit of Elijah. Now, people came to him and asked him, art thou Elias? And he answered, I am not, in John chapter 1. Jesus said, this is Elias, which was for to come. Here he says, Elias truly cometh first and, and, and restoreth all things. But I say unto you that Elias has come already. And it, they understood that he spake of John the Baptist. Now, let's look at the passage in Malachi chapter 4, verse 5. And it's interesting that these are the last two verses in the Old Testament. That's not a coincidence. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. And he shall turn the heart of the fathers to the children and the heart of the children to their fathers, lest I come and smite the earth with a curse. So interestingly, the Old Testament concludes with a prophecy of John the Baptist. And then, you know, you turn the page into Matthew and what do you see? You know, right away in chapter three, you see John the Baptist coming on the scene. And there's nothing in between Malachi and the New Testament. There aren't any other prophets that came and spake of the word of the Lord. There was a period of, of silence where there was not a prophet that is preaching, you know, God's word being directly, divinely inspired during that time. And so it's fitting that it would end Malachi, the, the last prophet of the Old Testament, not just the way that it is in your Bible, but chronologically, Malachi is the latest book. Okay. So then after Mal and by the way, let me just explain this to you because a lot of people for some reason don't understand this. And in fact, a lot of people will teach something contrary to this, but the prophecy books in the Old Testament are in chronological order, just so you know. Now, the major prophets are in chronological order within that group, which is Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, or Isaiah, Jeremiah, Lamentations, Ezekiel, and Daniel. Those books are in chronological order, but also the 12 minor prophets are in chronological order. You know, Hosea, Joel, Amos, those are the earliest prophets, and it does go in a chronological order through the 12 prophets. So Malachi is rightfully the last book, the last prophet of the Old Testament, prophesying the coming of John the Baptist. Now, people will sometimes debate or, or discuss, you know, was John the Baptist literally Elijah? Or did he just come in the spirit of Elijah? Is he just representative of Elijah? Does he symbolize Elijah? And honestly, I think that both viewpoints are valid viewpoints. I, don't, I, I think it's hard to dogmatically say one or the other. But I think that there's a lot of evidence for both. The evidence on the side of him literally being Elijah is the fact that he was filled with the Holy Ghost even from his mother's womb, you know, which is interesting. Not only that, but Jesus said, this is Elijah. So, you know, if you're going to take that literally... And then the evidence against would be, well, John the Baptist himself said, you know, when they asked him, art thou Elias? I'm not. But honestly, that's not necessarily conclusive because that's just John the Baptist saying, I'm not. That doesn't necessarily, maybe he just doesn't know that he is. You know, we don't know. So either way, I don't think it's really important. Either way, this scripture was fulfilled with John the Baptist. I mean, that's the important thing that the Bible teaches is that this prophecy at the end of Malachi is a prophecy of John the Baptist, whether he was literally John the Baptist come, or, or Elias come back or whether it was just symbolic and that he symbolized and was in the spirit of Elias. I think either one is, is valid. You know, I, it's hard to say for sure. We'll, we'll find out when we get to heaven. 
But what's interesting is that if Elias first comes before the coming of Christ and Jesus says, well, he's come already because of the fact that we have John the Baptist, the forerunner of Jesus Christ, it would be interesting then if one of the two witnesses is Elijah, if it is Moses and Elijah, then that would be an Elijah coming also right before the second coming of Christ as well, which makes sense because there are a lot of parallels between the first coming of Christ and the second coming of Christ, and about a ton of parallels. Uh, a lot of things are very similar in both cases. So it would make sense that there's a John the Baptist that comes just uh, shortly before Jesus Christ comes on the scene, and then that there would be a John the Baptist that would come, uh, an Elijah that would come right before the second coming of Christ. And in fact, if you look at the timeline, see, if you're, if you're pre-trib, this kind of falls apart for you. Because if you think about it, it says in Malachi 4, 5, and 6, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the coming of the great and dreadful day of the Lord. Now, the great and dreadful day of the Lord is something that we would associate with the second coming of Christ, would we not? I mean, if we read the great and dreadful day of the Lord, we're not thinking of Jesus Christ coming the first time. We'd be thinking of the second time when the sun and moon will be darkened and when Jesus Christ will come in the clouds and the trumpet will sound. That's referred to as the day of the Lord. It also says that the, the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the great and dreadful day of the Lord come, Joel chapter 2. That's quoted in Acts chapter 2. Also, we have that again in first, or 2 Peter chapter 3, talking about the day of the Lord. 1 Thessalonians 5 talks about the day of the Lord in connection with the rapture, okay? So it makes sense that Elijah would come before the great and dreadful day of the Lord. So if we're going with our theory of uh, Moses and Elijah being the two witnesses of Revelation 11, which I believe, if you get the timeline, they come on the scene right at the time of the abomination of desolation. They come right in the middle of Daniel's 70th week and they prophesy 1,203 score days clothed in sackcloth. That would be the second half of Daniel's 70th week, which according to, to the chart that I've put together based on scripture and when I, you know, I preached the whole thing through Revelation and, and proved it all scripturally, why I believe that that is the accurate uh, timeline. If you look at the chart that we have of Daniel's 70th week that Brother Richard Miller uh, helped me put together. If you look at that chart, you'll see that, you know, Moses and Elijah basically would, would come on the scene two and a half months before the second coming of Christ, before Jesus Christ would come in the clouds and the trumpet would sound, which would make sense because that's very similar to what happened the first time, right? A few months before Jesus' ministry, John the Baptist begins preaching. So you'd see a, a, a parallel there of, of what's going to be happening. So uh, that's just some, some things to think about. And I, you know, I don't want to go too deeply into that just because Mark chapter 9 is such a big chapter and there's so many other things to talk about. I don't want to make a big Bible prophecy sermon out of this. Plus, I'm, you know, I've preached so much on Bible prophecy when I did that Revelation series. I'm, I, you know, I'm like, I never want to preach on it again. Here, just watch this DVD. <laughs> you know, I already preached it. I preached the whole book of Revelation, verse by verse. So you know, I went through all that. But it's, you know, it's interesting. But this is just a good thing to understand, though, because you will have atheists and people try to throw this at you as a contradiction. I mean, I've definitely had people come at me with this. Hey, it didn't happen in a lifetime. And then when you go to Matthew 24 and he talks about this generation pass not passing away, he's talking about the generation that sees these things begin to come to pass. That generation will not pass away until all of the things have been fulfilled. And the reason that statement is important is to show us that the events of Matthew 24 are not stretching out over hundreds of years and thousands of years. They're actually events that will all happen in one generation of the end times, of the last days. It's all going to play out. Uh, boom, 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 you know, in sequence. Because some people will try to stretch Revelation out over thousands of years and say it's symbolic or, you know, the 1260 days are really 1260 years, you know, and they'll drag things things out and uh, th that's not an accurate interpretation. It, all, it is all going to happen in succession in one generation that will see all these. And we might be living in that generation. The way we see technology, I mean, it definitely is like it was in the days of Lot, you know, today in, in the United States of America yep. with all the sodomy and all the garbage that's going on. We see the technology of a cashless society. We could be living 
in the last days. We could be living in the final generation. And I do want to just quickly say this before I get off Bible prophecy, is that a lot of people are always asking like, you know, do you think that we're in the tribulation right now or has it already started or, or have any of the seals been opened or have we even gotten into it? But let me tell you something. Because I want to set people's mind at ease and I, and I also want people to understand things if they do happen in our lifetime or to understand that it's not happening. And so many people are confused and in the dark. It's really not that complicated, but you have to, you know, study the Bible and read Revelation. And obviously the first thing that happens are the seven seals are open. I mean, that's the first thing that comes at you in Revelation when you start seeing the end time stuff. And if you look at the seals being open, okay, the first seal that's open, and also Matthew 24 follows this exact order. Mark 13 follows the exact order of Revelation 6. When you look at the seals being opened in Matthew 24, and I want, I want you to pay close attention to what I say right now. In Revelation 6, when the seals are open, the first seal, it talks about a guy on a white horse who has a crown given unto him, and he goes forth conquering and to conquer, which that is the Antichrist. But then the second seal, it says, there went out another horse that was red, and power was given to him that sat there on to take peace from the earth. And there was given unto him a great sword. So if we actually look at what the Bible says, just right there in front of our face, the first thing that we see is a guy going out to conquer. And then when the second seal is open, peace is taken from the earth and everybody's killing each other. So what does that mean? The first thing you're going to see is world war. There's going to be a world. Now, I, we could say World War III. Hopefully there aren't a few more world wars in between. And hopefully it's not, you know, World War IV or World War V or World War VI. But let's say this is the next thing to happen. It would be World War III. So unless you see a world war taking place, we're not into Daniel's 70th week. We can't be into the end time. We can't be into the tribulation at all because that's the first step. Does everybody understand what I'm saying? The, you know, the first thing you see is not going to be an Ebola outbreak. It's not going to be like, oh, Ebola breaks out and we know it's starting. Now, look, I'm not saying that Ebola is not going to break out in America. I don't know. Maybe it will. Maybe it won't. There have been great plagues that have wiped out huge populations. The Black Plague, also known as the Bubonic Plague, in the 13th, 14th century wiped out one third of the population in Europe. I mean, one out of three people dead in Europe. Wiped out huge portions of China's population. But was that, was that the end times? No. It wasn't. So there can be great catastrophes and horrific events that take place on this earth. But, but unless you see the world at war, then it's, it cannot be the end. Because the first thing he says is wars and rumors of wars. And then he talks about in Revelation that peace is going to be taken from the earth. And there's going to be a great sword and people are going to be killed. And then that's what leads us into the other events. Because if you think about it, where did the League of Nations come from? World War I. Where did the United Nations come from? Result of World War II. So what's going to be the result of World War III? Well, we know the United Nations has a lot more power than the League of Nations had. And so what's going to come out of World War III? An even stronger world government, world governing body. And, you know, there have been all kinds of predictions about three world wars going back to the 1800s. People, you know, Albert Pike and, different, you know, different people that talked about the fact that there are going to be three world wars and, and how it's going to play out. And they even said in 1871, a document that says exactly what World War I was going to be fought over, World War II is going to be fought over. And you know what they said? And they were right. And you know what they said? World War III was going to be fought between, you know, Islam and the West. You know, so it sounds pretty believable to me. It sounds pretty realistic. So we don't know how it's all going to play out. We shouldn't pretend to know. But I will say this. Unless you see world war, we're not into it. So no, it has not started. We're not already into it right now. Just to, just to set your mind at ease. Okay. And then what do you see next? You know, after the warfare, you're going to see uh, people having food shortages, which makes sense because look at World War II, all the people who had food shortages because of war. 
you know, cutting off all the supply lines and things. So you see uh, great uh, high prices of food, then the fourth seal. You see uh, people dying of, of all manner of other things. That's where you'd probably see a lot of pestilence and disease and, and other ways that people are dying. And then the fifth seal is the persecution of believers, where basically Christians are being slaughtered and, and, and killed for the cause of Christ. And then the sixth seal, you know, is where we are rescued because the Lord Jesus Christ comes in the clouds, etc., etc. Don't have time to preach all that tonight, but I just thought it'd be worthwhile to take the time to explain to you that uh, until you see World War, you, don't, you can't even think this might be it. Now, if World War III happens, that still doesn't mean for sure that it's the end of the world because it wasn't the end of the world when World War II happened. So when World War III happens, then you watch for the other signs. And the major signs that you're going to watch for are, of course, going to be the temple to be rebuilt in Jerusalem. And then, of course, ultimately the abomination of desolation, the Antichrist being revealed, the man of sin revealed, where a man basically is claiming to be the Messiah. When you see the Jews embracing someone as their Messiah, and then you see Islam, you know, accepting that same person, and, uh, and he's going to be coming in the name of Jesus, so the, the Christians that are not saved, the apostate Christians, the fake Christians, are going to be proclaiming him as the second coming of Jesus Christ. When you see that man on the scene, and you see the temple, and then you see two, the two witnesses show up, you know, that's when you know for sure this is about to happen. You're at the very end at that point. Okay. But what's the first step? What's the first thing? war. And if you don't see that, you're not there. You say, well, there, there's war all the time. There's constant war. Yeah, but I wouldn't say that peace is just totally taken from the earth right now. You know, when you see that, it's world war. It's World War Three, or four or five or six or seven, but hopefully it's number three. Even so, come Lord Jesus. So anyway, let me, let, I got to get off that. Spending too much time on that. So we, we covered, yeah, I'll set aside another night to cover this. Yep. And then, or I'll just hand you the DVD and call it good. <laughs> just kidding. All right, so let, let's just jump into this in verse 14. It says, And when he, when he came to his disciples, he saw a great multitude about them, and the scribes questioning with them. And straightway all the people, when they beheld him, were greatly amazed, and running to him, saluted him. And he asked the scribes, What question ye with them? And one of the multitude answered and said, Master, I have brought unto thee my son, which hath a dumb spirit. And wheresoever he taketh him, he teareth him, and he foameth, and gnasheth with his teeth, and pineth away. And I spake to thy disciples that they should cast him out, and they could not. He answered him, and saith, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I suffer you? Bring him unto me. And they brought him unto him, and when he saw him straightway, the spirit tear him. And he fell on the ground, and wallowed, foaming. Now, this is the first Pentecostal service in the Bible, the, the charismatic church, you know, where they roll on the ground, they're foaming and everything. No, I'm just kidding. But anyway, uh, I will say this, that I believe that the so-called charismatic movement today, much of it is demonic. It is demonic. You know, when you see people falling on the ground and, and rolling around and, uh, you know, the only time you see that in the Bible is when it's demonic. I don't see Jesus Christ uh, laying hands on people and them going like, Bleh! I mean, when, have you, when do you read that in the Bible? Peter, James, and John's laying hands on people and they, they're slain in the spirit, falling over and, you know, or, or the autistic. You know, and isn't it funny that the Jews do that weird autistic thing, right? You know, at the Wailing Wall. And then notice charismatics do that same thing. It's of Satan. This is not normal. <laughs> you know what? And it gives Christianity a bad name because the world sees that and says, you know, these people are freaks. These people are nuts. Because they are nuts. And people like Todd Bentley, people like Benny Hinn that do this kind of stuff where they're slapping people on the forehead and they're falling over and flopping around and, and look, it's weird. And you say, oh, well, it's all fake. It's all a show. You know, I've been to one tongue speaking, quote unquote. And, and again, I, you know, this needs a whole sermon too, right? Just on the tongues and the charismatic movement. But I've been to one service where they did this and it, it freaked me out. And I, I, you know, I'd never seen it before in real life. And I didn't know that this church was like that. And I saw a girl doing it. And it didn't look fake to me. This girl looked like she was not in the driver's seat. And, and I'm not joking. I'm dead serious. I was ready to call 911. 
because I didn't know that this is what they do because she was the first one who started doing it. The service had been going on for over an hour. No one was doing this. All of a sudden, this girl starts going, and, I'm, and I, I thought she was having a seizure. I thought it was epilepsy because literally, like less than a week or two before, a girl had come into the round table pizza where I worked and fell on the ground and had an epileptic fit. And so I thought, oh, this is the same thing, you know? And I called 911 at round table when that girl did that, you know? I don't know what to do. But uh, so I was ready to call 911 at this service. And I'm looking at this girl, I'm like, is she okay? And you know, somebody else came over and like put their arm around her, was like patting her, telling, you know? I was like, what in the world is going on? But then, okay, so she's the only one doing it. And there were hundreds of people there. And I kept waiting for the sermon to start because I'm, I'm sitting in this service. This is when I was a teenager. I'm waiting for the preaching. It's just song after song after song after song. So the preaching never came. Now, they would talk for like 60 to 90 seconds between songs, but I still thought we were in the song service. I still thought there was going to be a, a sermon that would happen. The sermon never happened. So finally, we went straight from all the music to the invitation. And this girl was the only one doing that. But then the, then the guy that was like running the show, he got up and said, a few minutes after she started doing that, and I figured like, I mean, I guess she's okay. You know, somebody else is taking care of it. He comes up and he says, listen, you know, the altars are open. You know, we're going to have an altar call. And he said, you know, if you need to, you know, get right with God, come on down the aisle. And he said, you know, maybe there are some of you here that just haven't spoken in tongues in a while. Come up here and speak in tongues. And when he said that, it was like the floodgates opened. Now there were just scores of people just. It was like, whoa. So then I figured out that that was what was going on with that girl. But I, I, didn't, I did not know what was going on with that girl until the guy said, hey, if you haven't spoken in tongues in a while, you know, come on up to the front here. And then I was like, oh, man, that's what this is. And then it was just like everywhere. Everybody was just freaking out. So then I just got up and just left. I just walked out and I sat outside the building waiting for my ride. And I just kept just hearing all the madness going on. And, you know, I could hear it from outside. I was like, what kind of a church did I go to? Because somebody had told me, like, oh, you need to go check out this church and blah, blah. And they told me that it was something completely different. And then I got there and it wasn't what I expected it to be at all. So anyway, that was my experience with it. That girl did not look like she was in the driver's seat. She didn't look like she was playing games. I mean, she, I think that people are literally demon-possessed when they start doing stuff like that, where they just... And I talked to a guy. One time I was giving the gospel to this guy at my work when I worked for an alarm company. And I'm talking to the guy, and, and he was at first kind of resistant to the gospel. Like I was trying to tell him that you cannot lose your salvation because Jesus Christ died for all of our sins. And all we have to do is believe in him and he gives us eternal life and he'll never leave us nor forsake us. And we're sealed unto the day of redemption and all this. And he was just kind of resisting me like, oh, no, 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 you can lose it. And, and trying to explain to me all the reasons why you could lose it. But then after I kept talking to him about it, you know, he started to soften up to the gospel a little bit. And he started to be receptive and interested in it. And he told me that he used to be a youth pastor at a Pentecostal church, you know, the charismatic, or the, the holy roller church or whatever you want to call it. And he told me, he said, I went down there and spoke in tongues before. But he said, you know, that's part of why I got out of it is because there was a lot of stuff that seemed weird about it. And that's why I'm out of church right now and everything. And, that's, and, and he was starting to think that, you know, maybe he was starting to understand that, that they were wrong and that what I was saying was true about how salvation is just a gift, just believe in Christ, it's eternal life. And I said, well, what, what happened when you spoke in tongues? What was it like? And he said, he said, I went down there and he said literally that it was like he just blanked out. And this is just, you know, I'm not saying this is authoritative. This is just one guy's experience that told me this. He said, you know, he basically just blanked out and didn't remember anything. And like when he came back to consciousness, they're like, oh, you spoke in tongues. You know, you did all this and you said all this. And, and he was just kind of like, okay, you know, but he had no recollection. That's pretty weird. And, you know, that's not what you see in the Bible. Because even in, in uh, 1 Corinthians, what is it, chapter 14, where he's uh, talking about this subject, he says flat out that, you know, people shouldn't be, you know, 
interrupting each other and talking at the same time during church. You know, one person should be speaking at a time, the Bible says. And you shouldn't have multiple people speaking at the same time. You shouldn't be speaking in a foreign language that other people don't understand. He's explaining how to have all things be done decently and in order in 1 Corinthians 14. And he flat out says there that if one person's talking, the other person should hold their peace. He says, because the spirit of the prophets is subject unto the prophets. Now think about that statement, because the spirit of the prophets is subject unto the prophets. You know what that means is that the prophets have control over themselves. It's not just God taking over and they just are talking and they can't stop. And everybody, 20 people are doing it at the same time and they're all just out of control. No, you're never just out of control. See, being filled with the Holy Spirit is different than being demon possessed, okay? Because when you're filled with the Holy Spirit, you know what, you still have control over your mouth and your body and what you're saying. Yes, you do. Because being filled with the Holy Spirit is, is, is a voluntary act, you know? It's not that the Holy Spirit just takes over your body and just talks for you, you know? And, and sometimes, you know, people almost make it sound that way because they get real dramatic when they're talking about being filled with the Spirit. You know, just, just take me out of the way, Lord. Just take control, Lord. Just control me. But it's, sorry, not going to happen. Not biblical. The spirit of the prophets is subject unto the prophets. And you know, the men of God who spake as they were moved by the Holy Ghost. Look, the Holy Ghost moved them. They spake. He did not just take over their body and speak using their mouth and body, literally controlling them like a puppet or a robot. That, but here's the thing. With people that are demon-possessed, though, it is a situation where the devil will take over their body. And that's why they'll speak with other voices that are not even their own voice, or they'll speak in, a, in a, another language that's not their own language. They say, oh, they're speaking with other tongues. No, it's deception because the devil counterfeits everything that, that's real. So yes, there is a real miracle in the Bible where people would speak a foreign language that they did not know. But when they did that miracle in Acts chapter 2, they actually spoke it to people that needed to hear the word of God in that language. So it was a soul winning tool. It was like you have people that are from a foreign country and they're hearing the word of God in their own tongue because God miraculously allowed someone to be able to speak that foreign language. But when you see this counterfeit charismatic movement of the Todd Bentleys, the Benny Hens, the Holy Rollers, the Four Square Church, the whatever, the charismatic church, when you see them doing it, it's confusion. It's people that are out of control. Their spirit is not subject unto them, and they are not in the driver's seat, and they're speaking in languages to people that, that already speak English, and then they're just busting out in some, you know, and there's no point. It doesn't make any sense. It's nothing like what you see in the Bible. So it, 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 the reason that it's good to point it out at this point is because Mark is the gospel that talks the most about people being demon-possessed. Almost every chapter of the book of Mark covers this. And what do we see when we see people demon-possessed? Well, here we see a guy that falls on the ground and he's wallowing. You know, what does it mean to wallow? Think about it. You know, pigs wallow in the mire, right? What are they doing? They're rolling around, they're flopping around. And what are these people doing at the Charismatic Church and at the Benny Hinn Crusade and at the Todd Bentley Crusade? What are they doing? They fall on, the, fall on the ground, check. Wallowing, check, okay? And then it says foaming. Yeah, they're probably doing that too. There's probably some foam. What's foaming mean? Foaming is when basically, you know, spit would begin to accumulate on the outside of your mouth and kind of bubbling, you know, that little white bubbling situation on the outside of your mouth. That would be foaming. And sometimes when you talk about somebody being really mad, you say, oh man, he was really foaming at the mouth, right? Like a dog would foam at the mouth because they get all this saliva, you know, and there's this foam and spit flying and everything when people get angry or a dog gets angry. That's what's going on in this story. And so if you see people, you know, if somebody has to take a tissue and wipe the corner of their mouth when it's over, that is three strikes and you're out. You know, fell on the ground, strike one. Wallowing, strike two. Foam, you're out. You know, you're demon possessed, buddy. And look, that's what the Bible teaches here. 
Funny when people are, are filled with the Spirit. Where are people falling on the ground when they're filled with the Spirit in the Bible? Where do you say, does anybody not know what I'm talking about where they do this slain in the spirit thing? Come on up here, Brother Matt. I, got, I have to demonstrate this just in case. I don't like to take anything for granted in church, okay? Basically, what happens is a Benny Hinn will come up to people, and usually there'll be a whole line of people, and he'll, you know, either speak in tongues or say, you know, hakalagandala, you know, and he'll go like, wham! And basically, okay, if we were doing this for real, he would fall over. So I just go like, Bow! And then go ahead and fall over. Bow! No, <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. But what we forgot, go ahead and sit down. What we forgot, though, was we got to have the people to catch them, right? Didn't they have the people to catch them? Yeah. Yeah. So, if, by the way, Brother Garrett's the expert on this. If you want to find out more about this after the service. <laughs> but anyway, uh, people will, you know, people will fall over. They'll catch them. And, you know, it's on YouTube, folks. You know, there's a lot of it on YouTube, unfortunately. But basically, that's what they do, and they stop. But here's what's funny. Did you know that the Roman Catholic Church actually does that, too? They do it, because my, my wife, now, nowadays, they're kind of getting away from it as they're more modern. But my wife, when she was a kid, the priest slapped her in the face and said, Receive the Holy Ghost, and slapped her in the face. And she said now that they're kind of getting more liberal, kind of watering down, it's just kind of like a, a light pat. But she said back in the day, they'd really just receive the Holy Ghost, you know, slap you down. And they would slap you in the face and tell you to receive. Now, Jesus just breathed on them you know, instead of receive the Holy Ghost. But, you know, it's just funny how Satan's religions will have similarities like that. This whole, you know, slapping you and you fall over and you're slain in the spirit and you're wallowing. It's garbage. It's unbiblical. And they'll try to find some obscure verse to back it up of, you know, oh, well, you know, when Daniel, you know, was visited by the angel, he, you know, fell over or whatever because he was just so terrified by this giant angel. But that's a big stretch, my friend. We have all this New Testament scripture about the Holy Spirit's workings, and we don't see anything like that at all. So, yeah, you're just misinterpreting some Old Testament passage that was unique to a certain person. And, and you know, the angel didn't slap him on the forehead, and it wasn't a preacher. That said, it was just he was confronted with some gigantic angelic, cre you know, and he just, he just fell over. Because, you know, people pass out when they're scared. Or people just, you know, they get nervous and they get weak and they fall over. I mean, sorry, that was just one isolated incident with Daniel, and you're just going to line up a thousand people and let's just recreate that, you know. And I'm telling you, I don't see how any sane person could, could watch that and say, you know, this is just like the book of Acts. This is the power of God. This is the New Testament, you know, uh, and so forth. But there are tens of thousands of people. I mean, if Benny Hinn came to Phoenix, he could pack out, right, a stadium easily. So this is, I'm not preaching it's some obscure thing that a few, a few weird people follow. No, lots of otherwise ordinary people, tens of thousands of them are following this stuff. And if Benny Hinn came to town, he could pack out a massive, I mean, just pick, he'd probably pack out the sports arena. I mean, he has huge crusades, huge crowds. And I mean, you know, I, I, probably a lot of people are just showing up just to see the show. I'm not saying everybody who shows up believes in it, but honestly, there are a lot of people who do believe in it, and so it needs to be exposed for what it is. It is demonic. And people say, oh, you're blaspheming the Holy Ghost if you say that it's demonic. No, because guess what? Some things are demonic, okay? And you know, you say, prove that it's all demonic. Okay, no one who does it, no one teaches the eternal security of the believer. Show me one faith healer, slap you down, wallowing, foaming preacher that will teach you the eternal security of the believer. They all teach a false gospel. So if their gospel doesn't line up with the word of God, what does that tell you about their miracles? That they're lying signs and wonders. Because it has to jive with the Bible, folks. Yeah, Jesus did miracles, the apostles did miracles, but they also stayed with the word of God. They didn't teach all this false doctrine and, and, and heresy. So we see this guy who's, who's uh, demon-possessed. He falls on the ground. He wallows. He's foaming. And watch this. This is pretty chilling when you look at verse 21. He asked, they asked his father, how long is it ago since this came unto him? And he said, of a child. 
Now, what does that tell you? That people could be demon possessed even as a child. And you could say like, oh man, I would never want my child to be demon possessed. I mean, isn't that a horrible thought to think that your child would be demon possessed? And that's why this father is so distraught. And he says, of a child in verse 21, and oft times it hath cast him into the fire and into the waters to destroy him. But if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. You know, this shows also that some suicide could be a result of demonic activity. When you see people throwing themselves in the water, throwing themselves in the fire. Now, obviously, there are a lot of suicides that have nothing to do with this. But some suicides are obviously caused by this, if this is what these spirits are doing. Just like in the earlier chapter, 5, when we saw the demonic spirits cause the swine to commit suicide. They all ran off the cliff violently down a steep place and perished in the waters. What a waste of a lot of bacon, you know? <laughs> Hopefully the salt water kind of cured it into the right bacon, but probably not. So we see this suicidal tendency of those that are possessed with devils. And this guy, obviously, he loves his son and he's upset about it. And he says, if thou canst do anything, halfway through verse 22, if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Now, by saying that, isn't he kind of doubting Jesus' ability a little bit by saying that? But, you know, if you can do anything. So that's why Jesus turns it around on him and, and basically is saying, you know, it's not my ability that's in question here because I have all power. So that's why the guy says, well, if thou canst do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said to him, if thou canst believe, all things are possible to him that believeth. So he turns it around and says, well, no, it's actually, you know, can you believe? And I love what this guy answers. This is one of the, the, the greatest verses in the Bible. And straightway, which means immediately, the father of the child cried out and said with tears, Lord, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. And, and can't you relate to that statement? I mean, I think everybody can relate to that statement of having faith, but you know what? No one's faith is perfect. We're human. And a lot of times people ask the question, well, you know, how much do I have to believe? Uh, a lot of people doubt their salvation and they say, well, you know, I just don't know if I believed enough. But honestly, you know what? God just expects you to just whatever little measly puny faith you have, if you just put it all on Jesus, you're saved. Just put it all on Jesus and be saved. He said you have to believe with all your heart, which means that you can't believe in Jesus and something else. Well, you know, I believe in Jesus, but I kind of believe in Buddhism, too. And, and, you know, I figure either way I'm covered. You know, I'm, I'm kind of trying to live up to the Buddhist ideals just in case so that I can get reincarnated as the right thing. You know, or just in case. Or I'm going to cover myself with just Islam and Christianity or whatever. You know, or I'm Judeo-Christian. You know, I'm going to kind of follow the Torah and try to do that, go to some synagogues, call some people rabbi. But I'm also a messianic, you know, so I'm believing in Jesus also. And I'm trying to, you know, synthesize the two. You know, you have to put all your faith and trust in Jesus. Not on your works, not on another religion. But you say, well, but how much do I have to believe? I mean, do I just have to just have the perfect faith, just faith that could move mountains? No, you don't. Because if you just believe, and, and, and you know what I've often said too is it, to the question, how much do you have to believe? You have to believe it enough to confess it with your mouth, you know? And I mean, how much faith does that really take to just bow your head and just say, Lord, I know I'm a sinner. I know I deserve to go to hell, but I believe that you died on the cross for me and rose again. Please save me. You know, if you say that and you're sincere about it and you mean it from your heart, even if you have doubt, as long as you're putting what faith you do have on Jesus, He'll save you. You know, he wants to save you. And I like the fact that this guy said, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. So this guy is saying that he believes, but he does have some doubt. But what happens? Jesus heals. He gets what he wanted. So apparently that was enough for Jesus. Because he says, Lord, I believe. Help thou mine unbelief. Jesus doesn't say, well, that's not good enough. Because you need to have total mountain moving perfect faith in what I'm about to do or I can't do it. Is that what he said? No. Just look, if you believe enough to show up and say, I believe, help thou mine unbelief. You know, that's good enough. He says in verse 25, that's why the disciples said, Lord, increase our faith. Did the disciples have the ultimate perfect faith? No. 
He said, if you had faith as a grain of a mustard seed, he's kind of saying to them, you know, your faith is like less than a grain of mustard seed. And they're like, increase our faith. But we all need to increase our faith because we all have very little faith. And we don't, none of us have a perfect faith that never doubts, that always is uh, uh, without doubt. Look what the Bible says in verse uh, 25. When, when Jesus saw that the people came running together, he rebuked the foul spirit, saying unto him, Thou dumb and deaf spirit, I charge thee, come out of him and enter no more into him. And the spirit cried and rent him sore and came out of him, and he was as one dead, insomuch that many said, He is dead. So when this demon is cast out of this guy, it's like one last blaze of glory. This demon just causes the guy to just writhe and foam and, and whatever. And then the guy stops the writhing and stops moving. They think that he's dead. This is it. He's done. But of course he wasn't. The, the demon had just left him. And it says in verse 27, Jesus took him by the hand and lifted him up and he rose. And when he was coming to the house, his disciples asked him privately, why could not we cast him out? And he said unto them, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So the apostles had been given power to cast out devils. And everywhere they went, they cast out devils. And they said, Lord, even the devils are subject unto us. And they were amazed by the fact that they had the power as apostles to cast out devils. In this case, they tried to cast out the devil and they could not. And that's why Jesus stepped in and did it. Because while Jesus is up on the Mount of Transfiguration with Peter, James, and John, this is going on with the disciples trying to cast out this demon. It won't be cast out. And he explains why. He says, this kind, meaning this kind of devil, can come forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. So the Bible is talking about a certain type of devil that prayer and fasting is the only way for a person to be delivered from that devil. So that's pretty interesting. Uh, to, to read that in the Bible. Now, here's the thing. The modern Bible versions are changing this. This verse is completely removed from Matthew 17. Because remember, Matthew 17 is a parallel passage with Mark 9. Matthew 17, 21 is one of the verses that the NIV, the ESV, these new versions completely remove. Howbeit, this kind cometh forth by nothing but by prayer and fasting. Not only that, though, the new versions will actually just remove the word fasting from a lot of verses. Not just where they take the whole verse out in Matthew 17, 21, but a lot of them will, will change a statement like this to just, oh, well, this kind can come forth by nothing but by prayer and just leave out the fasting. Another notorious example, and I want to I look this up. Uh, who stole all my false Bible? Oh, here they are. I thought all my false Bibles had been stolen from me. But, uh, you know, whoever steals these things, that would be its own punishment, you know, to have to, to have to read this thing if you steal it. But there are a lot of verses that will remove fasting in the New Testament. And you say, you know, well, what's the big deal about that? Why does that matter? Well, you know, if, if God's talking about fasting, then we need to hear about fasting. We need to learn about it and we need to, you know, get the, the teaching on it. But not only that... Uh, one place where it actually affects doctrine and affects practice, aside from just, you know, basically causing people to not think about fasting because of the fact that it's hardly mentioned in the new versions, it's taken out so many times that people would be less likely to fast. I mean, think about it. If you're reading a King James and you're reading a lot about fasting, you're probably going to think more about, hey, this is something that I should be doing or this is something that I can do. But if you're reading one of the new versions, it's just not really in your mind because there's so many places where it's removed. But it actually really changes the meaning in 1 Corinthians 7. And you don't have to turn there, but this is where it's talking about husbands and wives and, and the physical relationship that husbands and wives are supposed to have within marriage. And he says, you know, in the King James, defraud ye not one the other, except it be with consent for a time that ye may give yourselves to fasting and prayer and come together again, lest Satan tempt you not, that Satan tempt you not for your incontinency. So what's he telling them? That they should never uh, defraud one another of the physical relationship in marriage, except if it's with consent for a time that you may give yourselves to fasting and prayer. Because obviously it makes sense that if you're fasting, which is basically depriving yourself of food, it would make sense to also be deprived of the physical pleasure associated with the relationship within marriage. But in the NIV and these new versions, because they are so zealous to remove fasting from so many verses, listen to how the NIV says, 
do not deprive each other except by mutual consent and for a time. Okay, that part's similar to what the King James says. That you may devote yourselves to prayer, period. So now it's just like, oh, just abstain from it just for periods of being devoted to prayer. Now think about how you could misinterpret that where you just say, you know, we're just going to pray extra this month. In 2015, we're going to devote ourselves to prayer. Now, you know, it's like, whoa, that's not good for your marriage. But here's the thing. If it's for fasting and prayer, well, how long are you going to go without food? Right? So it's not some super long abstinence where it's just like, oh, well, we're just really going to be devoted to prayer in the month of December or whatever, you know, or just in the year of 2015. And listen to me. There are people out there, believe it or not, who do not engage in a physical relationship with their spouse for very long periods of time. And, it's, and the Bible says that you're opening yourself up to temptation for Satan to tempt you for your incontinency. And it's funny because it says it has to be with consent. So you can, like, if, if, if one spouse were to say to the other, hey, you know, I'm, I'm embarking upon this uh, period of, you know, three days of fasting or, you know, or I'm fasting tomorrow or I'm fasting for the next seven days or whatever. You know, it's not just a statement. It's, it's actually, you know, it might be like, well, hey, I'm fasting tomorrow. It's like, well, no, I had plans for you tomorrow night, honey. <laughs> you know, so it's with consent. And what's funny is that, you know what, Arden, you know what people in America today teach? And even Christians teach this stupidity, that you have to get, your, you have to get consent from your spouse every time in, within marriage to have a physical relationship with your spouse. But you know what I believe? Is that when, when I said I do, and when my wife said I do, that was consenting for the rest of our lives. And the only consent that I need is not to do it. I'll get consent to not do it, okay? Or she'll get consent to not do it, but we're not gonna get consent to do it. Because guess when you consented? When you said to have and to hold from this day forward for better or for worse, you know, and people are like, oh, my husband raped me. What in the world? That, that, how can that even exist? That's stupid. Okay. And you say, oh, Pastor Anderson, you're nuts. No, you're nuts. Anyone who comes up with rape within marriage is an idiot. It's your wife. It's your husband. What's the matter, Pastor Anderson? Why are you so shook up? Oh, my wife, you know, violated me. It's like, what in the world? It's, it's my wife. <laughs> you know, oh, I need counseling now. I've been violated by my wife. What in the world? But that's the kind of stupidity that we, I mean, what do you expect from the people who have to make a third bathroom? Because a men's room and a ladies room isn't enough. You know, you need a, a third bathroom for mixed people, you know, for trans whatever they are trans queer transgender transsexual whatever garbage look we live in a day of stupidity and you know what the bible is right and i don't care what anybody if, if anybody walks away from the sermon and says pastor anderson is the taliban and he's islamic and he's crazy and he's wild and what you know what put it in your pipe and smoke it okay or put it in your pope and smack it whatever so what i'm saying is that You know, the consent is not to do it. But do you see how if you remove fasting, you completely destroy the passage? The passage doesn't even make sense anymore. Why would you? Look, don't we pray every day? I mean, who prays every day? Every day you pray. Yeah, exactly. Okay, but do you, who fasts every day? Yeah, nobody. You'd be dead. So, no, so fasting is the thing where it's like, okay, you know, there's going to be a consent where we go a time where we go without the physical relationship for fasting. Because, it, because look, the Bible actually condemns, and you can actually cross-reference this with Isaiah 58, where the Bible condemns, he says, in the day of your fast, you find pleasure. And he says that's a bad thing, that when you're fasting, you're not supposed to be enjoying pleasure. It's a day to afflict your soul. So it's not compatible to fast and say, oh, I'm fasting today, and then have an intimate relationship with your spouse on the day that you're fasting because you're not supposed to find pleasure on the day of your fast. Does everybody understand that? So then it makes sense. But when you have the NIV, it's just, oh, you need to pray? Well, abstain. But you know why? It's because the NIV is from these Catholic manuscripts 
And what do the Catholics teach? Oh, you know, even within marriage, it's still a sin, and, you know, you got to be cleansed from, uh, you know, all this stupidity. So that's why you get that teaching in the NIV. But honestly, any time you start taking out words, you're going to affect doctrine. You know, even if you say, well, fasting's not that important. Well, who are you to say what's important and what's not? And it definitely changed the meaning in 1 Corinthians 7, and it definitely changes the meaning in Mark 9, where we are, and in Matthew 17. When you take out the fasting, then you don't understand that the reason why this devil could not be cast out is because it comes out only by prayer and fasting. Which, I mean, to me, that tells me, I guess, Jesus was doing the prayer and fasting necessary. And we see evidence of Jesus fasting, of course, and that's a whole other sermon in of itself. I got to hurry up and just quickly give you a few highlights from the rest of the chapter because we're out of time tonight. But uh, basically, once we finish up with the story of the one who is demon-possessed, ending in verse 29... In verse 30, he talks about how he's going to be killed. And he says in verse 31, For he taught his disciples and said unto them, The Son of Man is delivered into the hands of men, and they shall kill him. And after that he is killed, he shall rise the third day. But they understood not that saying and were afraid to ask him. So they didn't quite understand the fact that Jesus is going to die, be buried, and rise again, which is interesting. Then uh, right after that, The disciples are arguing about who is the greatest among them. Which disciples are the greatest? And Jesus rebukes them for that, and he puts a little child in their midst and tells them in verse 37, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name receiveth me. And whoever shall receive me receiveth not me, but him that sent me. And he basically says that he sets a little child in the midst of them, and he says, you know, the greatest among you is the one that is as humble as this little child is basically what he's saying. And he's telling them, if you desire to be first, you'll be last. You know, and, and whoever uh, desires to be greatest will be the servant of all, the Bible says. Then after that, this is significant. In, in verse 38, John answered him saying, Master, we saw one casting out devils in thy name, and he followeth not us. And we forbade him, because he followeth not us. And Jesus said, Forbid him not, for there is no man which shall do a miracle in my name that can speak evil of me. For he that is not against us is on our part. Now, a lot of people will quote this verse where Jesus said, hey, if, you're, if they're not against me, they're for me. And people will quote this, but what they forget is the part where it says, if you're not with me, you're against me. Because Jesus said it both ways. Jesus said, he that is not with me is against me, and he that gathereth not with me scattereth abroad. Okay, so to just sit there and say, well, as long as they're not anti-Jesus, then they're, then they're for Jesus. Well, no, no, it's, it goes both ways. You're either with him or you're against him. And Jesus is saying that if people are doing things in his name and if they believe in him, just because they're not following with the disciples, they shouldn't be rebuked. What, you know, it's the same way if we said, you know, uh, Pastor Anderson, you know, we saw people out soul winning, but, you know, they weren't from faithful word going on with that you know <laughs> well great I mean we rejoice to see other people as long as it's the same gospel as long as it's the same salvation by faith in Christ you know not this thing of well they better they have to be with us but you know Protestant religion that's what Protestant religion teaches is like you have to be a part of the one true church the Roman Catholics will say you have to be a part of the one true church the Catholic Church you know the Mormons you got to be a part of the one true church the Latter-day Saint we have the priesthood or whatever and then you know Protestants will say that they are the one true church if you talk to hardcore Protestants and they'll tell you it's the invisible universal church and that that's the true church and that we're all apostates because we're not part of their baby baptizing you know one true church following Luther and Calvin and them but The bottom line is that there are all kinds of different people in this world that are believing in Christ, all kinds of independent churches that are independent from one another, and it should be that way. It shouldn't all just be necessarily one group. Okay, it's good that we're independent. It's good that there are lots of different churches. And you know what? We as Baptists, we're not saying that we're the only true church. Now, I'm saying the gospel we preach is the only true gospel, and I'm saying the Bible we preach is the only true Bible, but... You know, you'll run into non-denominational people that preach the same gospel and have the same King James Bible. You'll even, you'll run into people of other denominations sometimes. They're Now, I don't believe you're going to run into saved Catholics because the, 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 the Catholicism is so different. And there's so much of a difference in their gospel. 
But when you run into people that are of denominations that are closer to Baptist, more similar to a Bible-believing Christianity, especially amongst the non-denominational, you know, and, the, and the, the big fun center type churches, you'll run into people that are saved that are not Baptist. So Baptists are not saying, hey, you have to be Baptist to be saved. No, we're just saying you have to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ to be saved with all your heart. That's it. You don't have to be Baptist. But there are religions out there that teach that unless you're part of their organization, you know, you're not part of the true church. They'll say, you know, if you're not Catholic or if you're not Mormon or if you're not Protestant, you're not part of the true church. Whereas we just say that any Bible-believing church is a true church, no matter what it's called, as long as it's following the Bible and believing that salvation is by faith. Now, on the other side of that, though, when you step outside of churches that have Baptist in the name, it's a jungle out there. Let me just warn you. You know, I would, if, I'm, if I were looking for a church, I would try every Baptist church before I tried something that wasn't Baptist. Because honestly, even within Baptist, there's such a variety and there's such a wide spectrum. When you go outside of the world of Baptist, it's a jungle out there. And you're going to find that it's hard to find people that are doctrinally sound. You know, and your best bet is to go to an independent Baptist church. And that's where, you know, now, are there exceptions to that? I'm sure that there are. I'm sure there are churches in this world that have nothing to do with being a Baptist that are good, Bible-believing, you know, Bible-preaching, gospel-preaching churches. But the majority of them are called Baptist in the English-speaking world. And so uh, just save the trouble of looking at all the other churches that aren't Baptist. And, you know, because the chances are they're off the deep end, okay? But anyway, uh, just one last thing in this chapter is at the end, there's this great passage on hellfire. And this is a great passage to turn to with people if they don't believe that hell is fire. They believe it's a state of mind. Because uh, very clearly at the end of verse 47, that's a great place where it just says it right there at the end of verse 47, into hellfire. Just that phrase is a great phrase to show somebody who says, well, I'm not sure hell's really fire. Well, into hellfire. I mean, there you go. And the Bible's just talking about the horrors of hell where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched. Uh, one thing I would just point you to is that that quote of where their worm dieth not and the fire is not quenched is from Isaiah chapter 66. It's actually the last verse of the book of Isaiah, Isaiah 66, 24. It says, and they shall go forth and look upon the carcasses of the men that have transgressed against me. For their worm shall not die, neither shall their fire be quenched, and they shall be an abhorring unto all flesh. So the reason I point that out is because it's worded slightly differently in Isaiah 66. It says, their worm and their fire. Whereas here it just says, their worm and the fire. But I think it helps you to understand it when you read it from Isaiah. Because a lot of people will think like, what does it mean, their worm? You know, I didn't even know I had a worm, you know, people will say. But when it says their worm, if we compare that to their fire, what does it mean by their fire? The fire that's tormenting them. So it makes sense that their worm would be the worm that's tormenting them. I've heard people come up with all these crazy things that, you know, when people go to hell, they're going to become a worm. I've heard people say that. You know, if you go to hell, you actually become a worm in hell. And you're tormented in hell as a worm. Now, that's obviously not true. <laughs> or they'll say, you know, oh, your worm is your soul. That's another word for your soul, your worm. Well, you know, you know, I guess, you know, your soulmate, you know, we're, we're, your worm mate, you know, we're, our, our, you know, our worms are just really in tune. You know, no, worm, sorry, worm is not a word for your soul, okay, ever. So when it says their worm, I think it makes more sense that it's the worm, if it's the fire that torments them, be the worms that torment them. Because the Bible does talk about people being tormented in hell, eaten of worms. It does use that uh, wording in Isaiah 14. And a lot of times the answer to your spiritual questions will be found in the same book. So in Isaiah 66, their worm, you back up to chapter 14 and read about the worms feasting on people in hell in Isaiah 14. So then it makes sense. Because usually when you read chapter 66, you already read chapter 14. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Father, we thank you so much for this chapter, Lord, and, and for uh, the, the great things that we could learn from it, Lord, and, and just help us to stay away from that which is demonic, Lord, because you even said in this passage that even a child could be 
possessed, Lord. And so uh, help us not to bring things that are satanic into our home, Ouija boards, uh, magic spells, and uh, other things that are just blatantly satanic. Lord, help us to, to keep our children away from these charismatic holy roller churches, Lord, where they could be exposed to these kind of foul spirits, Lord, even from a child. And help us to live a, a life that would be honoring and pleasing to you. And in Jesus' name we pray, amen.